to be here and to be in this pulpit. <sighs> wow. God's good. Amen. amen. And uh, it's good to be saved. And just a brief couple things. Uh, I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God. I'm nothing. I uh, grew up in the uh, hills of California. You know, you're in the last days when there's an evangelist from California. <laughs> you, you really... You know, the Lord's coming any time now, really. And, uh, but I uh, grew up in the, in the uh, hills up around, uh, oh, it's by Yosemite, up in the mountains. And got saved when I was 18, wasn't raised in a Christian home. And a little bit after that, got called to preach, went down to Pensacola, went to PBI, graduated in 1982, and uh, tried to serve God, tried to pastor. I am not a pastor. Uh, it took me a while to figure that out. And uh, 13 years of uh, hitting my head against a brick wall. I'm a slow learner. But I uh, finally realized it was evangelism. And got in evangelism, been uh, in evangelism now, a little over 20 years, something like that. And it's great privilege. Uh, this church is much bigger than the average church I'm in. A lot of them around 40 to 60 people. That's, uh, you know, common, very common. But... Um, it is a real joy to be here. Uh, briefly, there are some books and things on the uh, table in the back, and I don't want to spend too much time. This one, Terry said, show them the prayer card. We've got a prayer card. It's free. Uh, pray for us. Really appreciate that. Uh, this uh, is one of the latest books I've written, Even Ask God. Uh, this, in a nutshell, if you've ever had somebody break your heart, and uh, they were a close friend, loved one, relative, <clears throat> somebody that you were close to. And then some time went by, and they said, you know, let's forgive and forget, and let's go on. And you're like, all right. And you try to, something's not right. Something, and they say, well, if you were a good Christian, you'd be able to forgive. And you're like, well, I'm trying. I'm, you know, and, and, you're, you know, and then you start feeling like you're backslidden. And the thing is, they're not the ones that got their heart broke. And you say, yeah, you're supposed to forgive. Well, I, I write about that in here. But the Bible says, be ye uh, kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, have forgiven you. And uh, how, did, how did you get forgiven? And I'm not going to give the book away. I want to preach. But uh, let me just say the first step in your reconciliation with God was that God rebuked you. That was the first step. You had to know you were a sinner and you had trespassed against God. That was the first step. There's some other steps. Get the book, you'll find out what they are. And, and then uh, in 2005, I lost my voice. I was preaching over 400 times a year. And I'm really going at it, and I blew my voice out. Uh, this uh, book here, Good Vibrations, that's the California in me. Um, some of you might understand that. Uh, but uh, anyway, this is more of a secular book, but it's what I did to get my voice back. And I used to talk like, and I couldn't preach. I couldn't talk. I was done. And uh, long story short, found a, a lady that was an opera singer, had lost her voice. She and a Jewish doctor in Manhattan had developed these exercises to get the voice back. Uh, I had gone to uh, University of Pittsburgh. They said, we want to give you Botox injections in the neck. I didn't want to do that. Um, Lord uh, led me here. I was able to get my voice back. This is just step-by-step -step detailed the exercise is what I did to get my voice back. Um, and it's still, you can tell it's not a 100%, but it's preachable, which is, thank you, Lord. But anyway, these are, these are just two of them. There's others back there. Uh, we are able to take a card. We don't have it on the hand yet. Uh, we don't want to go there. But anyway, my wife is in charge of all that. You can see her. There's other stuff there as, as well. Uh, turn to Matthew. Book of Matthew, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 16 is uh, where we'll start, Matthew 16, 
And it is a great, great honor to stand in this pulpit. It really is. Matthew chapter 16, let's start in verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Let's bow our heads for a prayer. Father, Lord, it's good to be saved, good to be born again. God, to know that we're going to heaven. God, washed in the blood. God, thank you for the future that you've given each one of us that's saved. Lord, thank you for the privilege to read the holy words of God. Lord, we know there's no error in this book and these words. God, I am nothing. And I know that these people here tonight do not need to hear from me. But Lord, we need you. God, we need you to minister and work and move in our midst tonight. Whatever the needs are, God, I am not able to meet those needs. God, would you please grace us with your presence. Move amongst us. Draw us nearer to thee. God, I have your way and your will in each one of our hearts here tonight. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. There's an old song, and it says, Must Jesus bear the cross alone, and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone, and there is a cross for me. The text tonight is verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If you have any decency about you tonight, there ought to be a desire within your soul to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is worthy to be followed. There's nobody else worthy to be followed today. Buddha is not worthy. Muhammad is not worthy. Jesus Christ is the only one that's worthy to be followed tonight. You say, what do you mean worthy? He has earned the right. He has earned the right for your allegiance, for your dedication, for you to follow him. He has earned that right. Listen, the Lord Jesus Christ is holy. There's nobody else that you can follow tonight that's holy. He's worthy to be followed because he's holy. I tell you, he's worthy to be followed because he's kind. Because he's kind. The pagan gods, the people of the pagan gods live in an abject fear. They throw their babies in volcanoes. They throw them in rivers. The pagan gods, they're just harsh and mean and angry. That's not the Lord Jesus Christ. He's kind. He's worthy to be followed tonight. He's kind. He is the truth. The Lord will never lie to you. The Lord will never tell you something wrong. Uh, he is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to heaven. Uh, you must follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He's worthy to be followed tonight because he gave his life for you and me. We didn't deserve that. 
But he came and he died and he bled and he shed his blood to pay for our sins, dipped his soul into hell for you and I, rose again the third after the three days, three nights. Listen, he died for you. He's worthy. Amen. He is worthy to be followed tonight. And you say, well, preacher, I do. I want to follow Jesus. I, I'm trying and I want to. And that's good and that's right. But you cannot follow the Lord without picking up a cross. There is no way to biblically follow him without picking up a cross. The modern Christianity is a crossless Christianity. They blend in. They don't separate from the world. They don't look different. They don't talk different. They don't smell different. They, their music sounds the same. Their Bible reads the same. They don't come out. They're not separate. They're not picking up a cross and following the Lord Jesus Christ. You must, you must, you must pick up a cross. The old timers would say, no cross, no crown. And that's true. That is true. You say, well, preacher, okay, but what is a cross? What, 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 what do you mean, pick up a cross? Do you ever see those guys? Every now and then, walking down the road, usually in a white robe, and they've got this, you know, cross, and they're walking down there. I mean, I saw one guy, he had four by fours. He's walking down there. There was a wheel at the bottom of the cross. He's walking down there, you know, it's like, no, no, man, that's not it. And, you know, and up north, you won't see him in January. They're not there, not there, you know, but is, is that the cross? No, no, that's not the cross. You say, well, preacher, what is a cross? A cross is a place to die. That's what a cross is. A cross is where two ways meet. Uh, you've got stoplights all over Knoxville. You know why? Because there's two ways meeting. You got people going one way, people going another way, and they cross. Right. They intersect there. Yeah. The cross is where two ways intersect, uh, your way and God's way. Right. You see, we don't naturally go God's way. We naturally go contrary to God. It's in our nature. We're depraved. We're wicked. We're sinners. We don't naturally go God's way. We go our own way, which is down. But God's way is a supernatural way. God's way is the right way. And when you come to that crossing and you take God's will over your will, and you take God's wants over your wants. And you take God's desires over your desires. That's how you pick up the cross. The world looks at it and goes, oh, I don't want that. Oh, you people are so crazy. You're so nuts. I mean, that. oh, how horrible. Oh, I mean, the church down the road. I mean, it's not like that. Why, they're having a party every Sunday, you know? I mean, it's rock out for Jesus. I mean, they're having fun, but oh, you, you Baptists, you Bible-believing Baptists, you're just so hard. <laughs> no, it's Bible. It's Bible. It's Bible. And God's way goes against your way. Uh, take your Bibles. Go to Exodus 29. Look at Exodus 29. Terry Lee, could I get that water? Please. Exodus chapter uh, 29. Thank you. And in Exodus chapter 29, they're doing a, uh, oh, it's with the priests. And notice Exodus 29 and verse 26. 
And it says, And I shall take the breast of the ram of Aaron's consecration and wave it for a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be thy part. And they're consecrating these, these guys, Aaron. And he takes that breast of the ram and he puts it on a tool for that. It's like a pitchfork, I believe, a little one. And he takes that and he waves that like this. That's a wave offering. And he's got the breast of that ram on that thing. Now look at verse 27. And thou shalt sanctify the breast of the wave offering and the shoulder of the heave offering which is waved and which is heaved up of the ram of the consecration. So then they take the shoulder, they get that, and then they heave it. And that's this. And that's a heave like that. And they take that shoulder and they heave it up. And they've taken that breast and they've waved it. Well, you know what they're doing? They're making a cross. But you know what they're making it with? They're making it with something that's dead. They're making it with something that's died. And in order to follow Jesus Christ, you must die to yourself. You must die to your will, your wants, your desires, uh, and say, God, what wilt thou have me to do? Not my will, but thine be done. That's, that's how you follow the Lord. I, I remember hearing a, a story um, it wasn't, you know, 100 years ago, it was, I want to say it was like 20. It was over in India, and there were some Christians that had come to a town, and right outside the town, they'd set up a tent, and they were preaching the gospel. In those little towns, the head of that town is the Hindu high priest, and he's like a king. And the high priest and his wife, they had a, a son. The son was about 12 years old. And when they set up that tent, this young man decided to go. And I don't know if he asked or not. I, I have no idea, but he went. And after the preaching was over, the invitation given, that boy got saved. He got born again. And he got baptized. And oh, he was excited. Oh, I can only guess. I, I don't know how it was for you, but when I got saved, man, I was just so excited. I still am. Amen. I made it hazard to Wayne. I still am. And I can imagine he went home. He didn't know the reception that he was going to get. Why, it was the greatest thing he'd ever heard that the Son of God had died for him and he, he got saved. He went home and witnessed to his father and mother, the Hindu high priest. Oh, they were furious. Oh, they're just furious. And they said, you're not to talk about Jesus again in this home. That boy went ahead and talked about the Lord. Two weeks went by and that dad killed him and burnt his body and wouldn't let one Christian at, into that funeral burn. He said, what is that? That boy bore a cross. A super, you say, well, what could he have done? Oh, he could have shut up and not said anything about the Lord. But he kept witnessing and talking to him. You need, you need Jesus. You need to get saved. I don't know how. But he ended up being martyred for the Lord Jesus Christ by his own father. That's a supernatural way. Amen. It's not natural. You take uh, Peter, James, and John. They left their nets. Uh, Paul left his position. I was in a church uh, up north. And I, they had a Bible study for quite a while and I preached there and at the time this pastor had a job making real good money, six figures and I think he was making a quarter of a million a year 
And they had a nice house. It wasn't a mansion or anything, but it was nice. They were in, a, in an expensive area, uh, not rich, but anyway. And, uh, but it was nice. And we had good services, good things. And there was a, a group of Christians about two hours away. And they said, would you come and preach for us? He said, I'd be glad to. And he went and preached for them. And they said, would you come back? And would you come back? And finally they said, would you be our pastor? Two hours away. He drove out a little bit, a little bit. He was going to have to quit his job. He was going to have to sell his house. Move out there. When we were with them during those times, they had nice cars, nice clothes, good food. And he obeyed the Lord and he quit his job and sold his house and moved out to pastor that little group of Christians. He'd been there a couple years and I came by and he had me in to preach. And after the service, he was shaking hands and and I watched him, he reached out, shook someone's hand. I saw under his sleeve here, it was ripped. And I thought, oh boy, you never would have seen that a couple years ago. You say, what happened? He picked up a cross. He's bearing a cross, going out there and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to say number two, go back to Matthew 16. It says, if any man will come after me, it's open to anybody. If you're here tonight, you're not saved, uh, you need to be born again. You need to know that you're going to heaven when you die. It's not by this church. It's by the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to receive the Lord as your Savior. Be washed in the blood and get born again. No doubt about it. It's not baptism. It's, it's a free gift. And he says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It's open to anybody. And if, there's, if you have any character about you, you'll say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. Now I want to say the cross is not only a place to die, but it's personal. Notice what it says. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. You have a cross that you're to pick up and carry for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a personal thing. That song says, no, there's a cross for everyone. And there's a cross for me. For me. And you have a cross. Have you picked it up lately? You say, well, what do you mean? Sometimes it's just little things. Not big things. Just little things. You say, well, like what? Oh, like, don't watch that movie. Right. You know, yeah. I don't go to that website. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't listen to that music. Right. You say, and, and the way people are nowadays, oh, oh, that's just horrible. Oh, you mean I just can't. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you're really some big Christian, aren't you, you know? I mean, you got others that have been martyred, you know, burned at the stake, and you're whining about not being able to listen to a certain kind of music, you know? Well, aren't you a spiritual giant, you know? But uh, you take sometimes just little things, little things. You know, like throw the TV out, you know, get rid of it. That'd be a good thing, you know. That's a big one. No, not really. Uh, you take, they're just, you know, or books or whatever. But you say, well, it, God's going to deal with you. And there's going to be something tonight or tomorrow. And you're going to be going through life and the Spirit of God's going to come along and say, oh, that right there. Uh. And what are you going to do? Are you going to do it anyway? Or are you going to obey and say, Lord, help me. Help me. And just little things. I remember hearing a story Bob Jones Sr. told about a, a girl they were having in those days. They had the big citywide revivals. And he said there was, a, and they'd go for a month. And uh, he said he'd been there, I guess, four or five nights. And he said there was a girl that would come in about, she said, maybe 16. He'd be up on the platform. And he said she would just 
light up the place, just so full of joy, seemed like and happiness, and just, he said he started looking to see if she'd be there. And this one night, she was there. And he preached, and she came forward for salvation. The personal worker knelt beside her, started dealing with her about the need to ask Jesus to uh, come into her heart, to be born again. Uh, and she said, do you know you're a sinner? Yes. Uh, you believe the Lord died for you? She, she knew it all. And said, well, let's pray and you can ask the Lord to save you. You know you're going to heaven. And she said, well, I got one question. And she said, sure, what is it? She said, does that mean I can't dance? Well, well, we'll talk about that in a minute, but, but you know, you're, you're, you need to get saved. You don't want to go to hell. No, I don't want to go to hell. You need to get saved. Yeah, I do want to get saved, but, but if I get saved, does that mean I can't dance? Well, I don't know if that little girl ever got saved or not. You know what she saw? She saw a cross. And she was battling that thing, not wanting to pick it up. Hell ain't worth dancing over. I guarantee you that. If you're here tonight and you're lost, you need to get saved or you're going to hell. I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only way to heaven. But sometimes the cross, just little things, not big things. And then sometimes it's big things. And you say, what? like what? Oh, I mean, turn your whole world upside down. It's a privilege. You say, what do you mean? Maybe a missionary, you know, a missionary to tell someone about the Lord, maybe, and you're like, and, and the dreaded call, you know, he's like, like the dreaded call, Africa, ah, you know, so that people are scared to death, that's right, that's how they react, like, not Africa, you know. And it's a great privilege. I mean, you say, no, the Lord wouldn't, the Lord wouldn't call me to Africa. I'm too old. Really? I heard there was a man that went to Africa in his 90s and started three churches. Uh, you're not too old for God to reach down from heaven and say, I got a job for you to do. And that's a great privilege. And it may be something that turns your whole world upside down. Listen, the value of something is dependent on what it cost. What has your Christianity cost you? Amen. Amen. But I'm, I'm, I remember the, this brother. He was going to the mission field. He'd been pastoring. And uh, at the time, they had five kids. The kids were small. And uh, he had surrendered to go to the mission field. Uh, and his wife said, I'm not going. And she was scared. She said, I'll go with you in the, in the States on deputation, but I'm not going. And I talked to him and I knew the story. He didn't know I did know. And he was getting ready. He was almost done with deputation. And I said, brother, how you doing? And he, he just kind of stared off and said, oh, all right. There's just some things God's got to take care of. Almost like he wasn't even talking to me. Oh, there was a burden there. It was hard. It was just strong. But, and he's getting ready to go. And by the grace of God, she said, okay, I'll go. And they've been serving the Lord ever since, doing a great job for the Lord. But she saw a cross. Said, no, I can't pick that one up she did by the grace of God God may be dealing with somebody here tonight and you see something and it's like no there's no way the Lord will help you now I want to say this the cross must be chosen it must be picked up if any man will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross it's not forced on you it's not the Lord doesn't just, there it is. I mean, the Lord prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And he surrendered and went. Yeah. 
I, I know, I, got, I don't have a clock. That's dangerous for an evangelist. I understand that. And I know you guys are working, but I'll tell you what, in the book of Isaiah, don't turn there for the second time. Isaiah 14, uh, Lucifer, he says, How art thou fallen from heaven, all those first son of the morning? Uh, and then he says, For thou hast said, I will ascend, I will exalt, uh, I will play, I will be like. He said, I will, I will, I will. Five times. And Jesus Christ said, Not my will. When you say, My will, I want, I want, you're acting like the devil. Amen. Amen. And when you say, not my will, but thine be done, you're acting like Jesus. Yes. Have you ever surrendered? Have you ever said, Lord, not my will, but thine be done the best way you know how? If you've never done that, you need to do that. You need to do that. But the cross is chosen. You pick up a cross. You know, the Lord will he'll lead you. If you let him. And you get saved. And oh man, it's just so great. And man, you're going down the road, you know, and you're just, wow. You know, everything's wonderful. And in the middle of your path, it stands the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, hi, Lord. He says, hi. He says, oh, Lord, I'm so glad you saved me. He said, I love you. I'm so glad you asked me. I said, the boy, I said, oh, Lord, this is just great. He said, I know. And he said, but I, I got something for you. And, and he said, really? What's, what's that? He said, I got a cross. A what? A cross. That there's something I'd like you to do for me. Would you, would you do that? If I could do something for you, Lord, I'd like to. And he said, well, look down. And there in front of you is a cross. He said, I'd like you to pick that up. Well, it looks so heavy. It looks so gnarly and you want, yeah, Lord, I don't, I don't know if I have the strength. He said, I'll help you. I'll try. And you reach down and you pick it up. Oh, oh, Lord. And you start going. Oh. And after a while, it is going. So I, huh, it's not so bad. Well, this is good. And you're walking down there, and it's like, I mean, remember the first time you started tithing? Didn't that look like an insurmountable amount? <laughs> amen, amen, amen. <laughs> and, you know, and that's just beginnings. Anyway, but anyway, you're walking down there, and the Lord's there. And, hey, Lord, how you doing? He said, oh, doing great. He said, you're doing a great job with that cross. I couldn't do it without you. He said, I know. And, uh, but I got something else for you. You do? He said, yeah, look down. There's another one. This time it's bigger. This time it's heavier. Lord, I, I don't know. He said, I'll help you. And you reach down and get that cross. Pick it up. Oh, oh Lord, help. Oh, oh. And he said, he said, preacher, what are you getting at? There's going to be times in your Christian life where the Lord's going to lead you to the end of your strength. Amen. You won't have any strength left. You're doing your best. You're loving him. You're trying. And you're just going as best you can. And your strength is gone. What did Paul said? He, he said, when I am weak, then am I strong. There is given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. God's going to lead you to the end of your strength. Why? He wants you to get stronger. He wants you to grow. And in those times where your strength is gone and you don't have the answers, you get to know God in a personal way. That there's no other way to know him. Amen. But it's a choice. And you choose a cross. And many people choose to lay him down. To carry him for a while. And little by little... Oh, it's just too heavy. And they start lessening their convictions. They start compromising with the world. Why? They don't want the cross anymore. 
They're giving it up. They want an easier way. Don't do that. Don't do that. I want to say that your cross is heavy. I went over that. But it does. It gets very heavy at times. Uh, and I want to say last of all, last of all, your cross profits others if you'll carry your cross and glorifies God. If you will carry your cross there's going to be people's lives that will be changed, that will be helped, that will be strengthened. And you will have the great privilege of bringing glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. That, as a sinner, being able to do that, what a privilege. Take your Bibles, go to the book of Philippians. Just about done. Look at Philippians. Philippians 2. Philippians 2. The Lord bore his cross. I profited. You profited. And he glorified the Father. Look at Philippians 2. <clears throat> And look at verse 16, Philippians 2.16. Bible says, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Now let me explain that. Yea, and if I be offered, that's killed. That's an offering. If I be offered, what's the altar? Upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. Paul says, if I'm offered, if I'm killed, and that'll help you Philippians to grow and live for Jesus, I joy and rejoice with you all. That's it. When you carry your cross, others profit. Pastor and his wife carry their cross, you profit. Many, many people profit, and God is glorified. If you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you must pick up a cross. A couple years ago, over in Sierra Leone, they had the Ebola outbreak. You might remember that. Yeah. Over there in Sierra Leone was a man and his wife, Stephen Holt, and his wife, what's her name? Laura. And uh, they're over there ministering, missionaries. They had a girl from the States, teenager or younger, I think maybe young 20s, uh, just checking it out, seeing been there for a few months, and she's getting ready to go back. The Ebola outbreak, they were at ground zero. It was people dying all around them. Laura and this girl, they didn't even know it. They got on a plane. It was the last plane out. They were quarantining the entire area to the world. The natives had seen other missionaries leaving that came up to Steve and said, are you going to leave? And he said, no, this is where God wants me. You're my people. I'm staying. And those natives got a tear in their eye. And they said, you are a real missionary. And his wife had left, didn't know if he would die from Ebola, didn't know if he'd survive. They didn't know if they'd see each other again this side of heaven. 
But the natives around there heard about this missionary that had a car and he was a real missionary and they started coming and he's winning them to the Lord right and left and they're just, he, the Lord just working, working and they, he'd get a call at three in the morning we need somebody and he had to drive on these dirt roads uh, over and pick this person up that's dying and get him to a hospital and he's just working tirelessly. Many, many people got saved because he didn't lay his cross down. He carried it all the way. He's still alive. He's still serving God. If any man, it's open, will, it's up to you, come after me, that's the Lord Jesus. He's worthy. Let him deny himself. You gotta die to yourself. And take up, it's a choice. His, it's a personal cross. God's way. And follow me all the way home to heaven. Have you picked up your cross lately? Let's pray. Father, I pray, God, that you'd help us in a selfish Laodicean time to be a remnant of biblical Christians, cross-bearing Christians that are living for thee, seeking to glorify thee, denying ourselves, being what you want us to be, in this age. Lord, I pray you'd speak to hearts, have your way and your will in the invitation tonight, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, pastor.